right. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Iziko, Izzy Lanza. I am, I, mean, I am an open source AI evangelist at Intel. And today, the idea of this talk is more to talk about myths and AI broadly. Um, like, we'll go through some common myths, uh, even if you are a one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning on AI, and if you're familiar with AI in something that you think that is real in AI, this talk will be more around that for the next 40 minutes, 35 minutes. So we, when we talk about AI, and it's, it's my initial idea of this talk was more like to reflect about AI because we are listening a lot of LLMs uh, all the time, they are smart, they will be replacing all the people. Uh, maybe the idea of this talk is to go there. So um, <coughs> this is how, for instance, we, we thought about it 20 years ago or 10 years ago, how AI can be executed or can be done, right? From the replacing the entire body of a person for a more of funny way, like, like a movie, um, or for something more useful. Most people just think AI for something that can be very useful for the environment or for parks or for the city or for something that you think that is really helping you. So the agenda will be mainly five myths. Uh, the first one is the AI is the answer to everything. Now we love AI. We all want to use AI everywhere. And the other one is L LLMs. So it's everything about LLMs. The other is, the third one is if the LLMs can reason. So we think that the LLMs are smart enough. Let's see if that's real. The, the fourth one, which is the, um, the most important, and it's more related with this conference, that is open source. Uh, it says open source is risky. Uh, I, I don't know, we, we don't think that open source is risky. This talk was oriented for a different kind of audience, but I like the title of the myth, uh, like, is open source risky? And the last one will be jobs will be eliminated. So this is another fear that we all have, right? But let's, let's think about what is AI, what is actually AI? Um, and it can sound basic, but every time we start talking about AI, we need to go to the basics and we need to understand what AI actually is. So it's basically the capability of a computer, of a machine, to mimic the cognitive fun functions that we have as humans, right? It's something that can learn as we learn, that can behave as we behave, uh, that can solve a problem in the same way as we solve those problems. So that's basically the concept of AI. Everything that is, that is not doing that, even if it looks that it's doing that, it shouldn't be called AI, right? But that's more like a, like a recap of what is AI. So we can think that AI is the answer to everything because basically be, be, because we see AI everywhere. We see it, for instance, in our, in our homes when we have those cameras when we want to detect animals or, or whatever. Uh, even when we use ChatGPT, that ha we have my manager here, right? So if I can ask to ChatGPT, how can I persuade my manager? And ChatGPT can give me that answer, right? So we can think that we can use AI for everything. Same for social networks, we are seeing that or we are seeing that every time we see an, an advertising, seems that that advertising knows us and everything. So that's the part when we think that we are seeing every AI, AI every day and we think that we can use every AI every day. And that's something really fun. I mean, I love this, this image. This, and it's not something new. That is started in 1987, which is this document from this magazine which is they started to question what is AI and what was AI in the 80s. In that moment, they knew, for instance, that an AI program is not AI because it uses a logic and then if logic. Even if you can, can handcraft the entire human or behavior, if that's using that if then else logic, that's not AI, of course. But that's interesting because that's a concept for the 80s. And I don't know what is Prolog or Lisp or whatever, but I imagine that is something that we're using 
some kind of incident to happen. So this is what most, some people think that AI really is, but this is actually what AI is, is not. Okay. Um, yeah. So some things we think that are AI that are not actually AI, like a rule-based system. When you are watching Netflix and we are getting a recommendation, that recommendation, for instance, is a rule-based system, so it's not AI. It's something that someone or the company handcrafted, like if you've seen that movie, you probably would like that movie. That's not smart, right? It's like a table, it's like something that you see is a rule-based system. When you have the artist similarities, if you like an artist, they will recommend you some similar artists. Uh, for your ratings, based on your ratings, there is some tables when you will be getting your new recommendation. Now, and this is not AI. Even if we think that AI, even if we like to see it as AI, or if we like to advertise it as AI, a rule-based system is not AI. And we see it in a lot of places, to be honest. Let's finish with that. Like, once we talk about AI, there are two mainly different things. What is AI and what is not AI? AI is when you have something that learns from data automatically that can learn from the data. When it's not AI is when it's you handcraft everything, same for the previous example. Now, um, I will not go in details, but it's the examples will be, for instance, with neural networks. When you have to train a model, they have to see the data, they have to learn from the data, they have to adapt the model based on that data. That's what is what what we can call AI. That a sorting algorithm, a search algorithm is not AI. I wanted to do that introduction because sometimes, I don't know how you see it, but sometimes I see that we are seeing AI everywhere. And sometimes it sounds like, a, is, is, it, is it AI? And most of the times it's not. Most of the time we like to put, just because it's the buzzword, and we like to put AI there. Um, and this is why I wanted to like to reflect about that. Um, yeah, now it's LLMs. The first question is, was about AI, now it was all about LLMs. We can imagine that, uh, uh, we hear that LLMs are everywhere, and we like to force to use LLMs for everything. Seems like it was too much ago, like most people was using with deep learning. I mean, I've been, I've been working with machine learning or AI from the last 10 years or 15 years. And now since that is not just the buzzword using <coughs> deep learning. Most people is now using deep learning, even if it's the best thing to use or to solve some problems, we see that some, sometimes we are trying to force to use the LLMs. And see for the state of the art, when when we are working with AI, we, we start working with something and we like to know which algorithm is the best algorithm for the problem that we are trying to solve. In that case, for computer vision, for instance, we are still using CNNs for our YOLO or those algorithms that are not the same architecture as we use for the LLMs. We are not using transformers, we are not using LLMs. For time series, the same thing for graph. We are not using the LLM. So there are tons of applications that can be done that they are very useful and they are very mature when we talk about <coughs> those other problems. And, and something that I've seen, for instance, for time series, and I'm saying that, but something that I did for my, for my thesis actually is that time series for transformers, using transformers with the, with, with this, the architecture for the LLMs. Um, and I had a lot, of, a lot of comments from people saying, okay, why, uh, why are you using transformers when you have the state of the art, which is performs way better, which is the RNN, the CNN, and so on. And, and the result for that was, was pretty similar. I mean, using a very complex thing to solve a very simple problem, the results were very similar. So in that case, I prefer to use a very simple algorithm or CNN or RNN to solve my my problem or my time series problem. <coughs> and it's not just like that, it's also machine learning techniques. How, how many of you are working with machine learning or deep learning? Yes, good. 
And do you try to force LLMs and everywhere? <laughs> um, so for machine learning, for those of you that are not working with machine learning, uh, for instance, if you go to Kaggle, Kaggle is the place where most people try to compete uh, to find the best algorithm to solve the, a, a problem. Um, it's a bit wild, it can be wild, because we are, those competitions is just, we are just looking for 0 0.01 benefit of a model, right? And if you see the models that are actually winning those competitions, they are not transformers in most of them. Of course, there are competitions just for transformers or for LLMs, for reasoning, but most of them, Xibus is winning. Xibus is, deep learning is decision tree, right? Um, so it's not just about LLMs. We have a tons of things that we can do there. And Cargo is one of the best things to see which are the best models. Even if you don't trust that I hate, I would like to use transformers, whatever, but if you go to Cargo, there's always a competition with something similar of your, un of your use case, and you can see what, which is the model that is performing better. So now let's go, let's dive into the open source part. So when we talk about LLMs or computer vision, every time we want to download, and now we are going to LLMs, right? <laughs> um, Every time we, we want to download something, of course we go to Hugging Face, right? Hugging Face, for those of you that are not familiar, is like the GitHub, the, I mean, the best repository when you can download any model you want for LLMs. There are more than 500,000 models. So every time you download Llama or whatever, you go to, to Hugging Face, right? So, but there is, and let's start, to talk about that, we have some licenses. Let's just talk about the model. Every time we talk about a model, and since we are familiar with open source, we can imagine that there is a license, right? So we download the model, and some of them, they are more restrictive than others. We have some of them like, I don't know, Falcon and Mistral, that the model itself has a license, that is a patch it, that you can use it, and you can access to the weights. The other one is external API, to be honest, I wanted to put the license that we have an external API, but I didn't find I, I, I didn't find it because every time I try to go to OpenAI, for instance, what is the license to use that API? I couldn't find a license, so it's more like they say that it's up to you what the model does, but I couldn't find a specific license for that. And the mixed, which is, for instance, Llama and Gemma. And now I have a question for you. Um, how many of you think that Llama, two or three, or one, is actually open source? Okay, just two. And the other thing that is not open source, or they don't have ideas? So, so. Okay, great. So, actually, in the terms of open source, if we talk about open source, there is a particular commercial term that it says if, your, if the model, if, if the application that you are using for your model, with your model, is greater than 700 million monthly active users, you have to talk to Meta. So you have to ask for them. Uh, I have two things, two thoughts about that. One thing is I would love to be in that situation <laughs> first. <laughs> And the second one is, I can not understand that this is more something to restrict between Google, Meta, and all the other competitors to don't steal models, models between them. But in terms of open source, this is a restriction. Right? So it's, it's not open source as Meta claims. So we can talk about that for hours, like why Meta is saying that, why Meta is using the open source name, and so on. But that's not the goal of the talk. So what, what we would like to do is, or what we see as a community is that there is a trend. So if we see that one company started to do something, another company started to do the other thing, something similar, uh, we see that most people start to follow that trend. And if that trend is to make the models closer and closer and closer, we will have a problem as a, not as a community, but as a, 
I think as a society too, if we centralize everything to just two or three companies, we can have a problem, right? So this is basically, it's, it's an AI Alliance document that talks about why open source is important. I imagine that you, I mean, Intel is part of the AI Alliance. I'm also working with the AI Alliance in some projects. Uh, basically, some, mo mo most of the benefits that we can imagine, so why it's important open source, it enables the enterprises to use it, has security every time we make something open. We have the entire community looking for our model so we can make it se secure. Uh, we can enable the competition, right? Is most people can create their own model. Now we have not just one llama, we have thousands of llamas, thousands of mistrals or others, all the other models. So that's some benefits. I will not go in details, of course, because this, we are open source community. And that's another thing, but what it's really interesting for me is that something that I didn't know be before reading that paper is that most of the developments for an AI, they came from just the most developed countries, like two or three countries. Making those models open, of course, they will be enabled, for instance, research from even Africa or even Latin America, right? Um, the one that is highlighted here is like the power, like something that we imagine that is the foundation models will generate between two trillion or four trillion dollars. So that's another thing that is that is important. So AI Alliance is always pushing through the openness or the open source uh, with AI. And another thing that is working, that is happening with, the, with open source is the open source definition that the open source in the OSI is driving this uh, cool initiative to try to define what is open source in AI. It has a draft in the version 009. So it's, we are getting closer. I'm also participating here. We are getting closer to a final definition. There will be a talk, I think at 2 p.m., which will be the OSI presenting those details. So basically what happens here is every time we talk about the, an open source model, we can think on three parts in order to modify the open source AI system. We need, we need to have the weights, we need to have the model, so we need to download the model openly without any leather or restriction or something additional. We need to have the code because we all like to train that model, we like to run the inference. Uh, if you are working with LLMs, the, the way you use to run the inference it's not a simple, right? So you need to have a specific code, specific tokenizer or something like that to run that particular code. So you need to be able to access to open code. And the last one is data information, which is you can provide the data, you as a company sharing the, the, the model, you can provide the entire that data set that you use, which is huge of data, or you can provide the detailed informa detail information of which data you use to train that model. Uh, that will be a talk at 2 p.m., which they will go in details of that. But that's another very important step towards the definition of open source and AI. Same thing as I said at the beginning that most people is talking about AI and we probably is not AI. The term open source with AI, or open source AI, is another term that we need to define. We need to be clear and to say, hey, this is open source, this is not open source. The same, th the same thing as we did five years ago, 10 years ago, when we defined which code is open source, uh, the OSI is trying to do the same thing for open source and AI. Uh, so there are some QR codes, there are some public discussions, so if you want to be part, more than welcome. Um, yeah. So let's switch back to the LLMs, so what we can think that the LLMs can do. We can think that the LLMs, let's go for the, another myth, that is, we can think that the LLMs can reason, can reason. And it's, I, I don't know what is the, the real mistake here or problem, because I've seen a lot of papers or researchers that are talking about reasoning, um, but they don't specifically mean reasoning, right? So it's reasoning in the terms of AI, which is not reasoning. 
So when we talk about reasoning, it's how we reason, how we can reason something. We have our in our, let's suppose that we like to go to a vacation to somewhere. But what we do is we have personal experiences, we have knowledge, we have recommendations from other person, we have some reasons like I like the warm, I like the beach, I like the mountains or whatever, and we have the hypothesis. We have three or four hypotheses and we define from those hypotheses which is better for us and we take a decision evaluating what is the pros and cons that we have with those, with those different hypotheses. This is not how a lot of LLM works, right? Uh, it's actually, and that's very funny, because how we think in that the LLMs are reasoning is that we are actually providing the answer. Sometimes we think that the model is being smart or the LLM is being smart, but we are actually providing. If you have to make five questions and you are saying, hey, you should be going that place, the model will give you that answer on the thing that you think that is the truth. This is what happened with RAG, for instance. We can talk about RAG later, but it's if you say, hey, give me an answer based on that information, even if the model doesn't have that, that information, they will give you something based on that information. So, but what is an LLM, actually? How, how, they, how they reason? Let's think what they do. What they do is they are models that we, they were trained in a huge amount of data they, uh, Wikipedia, I mean, a huge amount of data. And they, gener they generate word by word. You have the next word, how the model works is, it's generating word by word and it's creating a new word or it's assigning a new word based on the likelihood of the next word. Right? So it's creating word by word and based on the phrase, that will be the next phrase and so on and so on and so on. So it's not doing like hypotheses or something like that. They are experts on retrieving information. And it says, I put retrieving because it's actually, how they complete that phrase is based on the information that the model was previously trained. If you are just talking to the LLM, right? Uh, it's based on that. And how can you be sure that the information that you are getting is not based on something that it previously learned? It's almost impossible to see that. Uh, and there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of research around that, which is almost really impossible to know if which data was particularly used or which data affected to the answer that you got. So we can, we can think that the models are reasoning, but probably they already knew the answer. If we go on the, on the making the models more intelligent or more understand or more smart, we can think of gene general AI. It's not generative AI, it's general AI, but it's called Guy Book. There's a very good book, uh, if you'd like to read. Uh, it's like a super intelligence. It's, it's pretty old, but it's pretty actual. It talks about how general AI can be achieved, right? And what is real fun, now we're starting to, to hear the general AI concept again, like, when are we going to read general AI? For those that are not familiar with gener what is general AI, is like total independence. It's a model, it's a model, it's a system that is totally independent and can learn, can adapt, can do something by their own uh, without any intervention, any additional, any external intervention. And we are not even close to that, to be honest. Um, but this book, for instance, which is interesting is that it gives you the percentages I mean, they talk to most the luminaries or most people relevant in that moment in AI. And they said that the general AI will be 90% reached in 2075. Let's say that they are lying and will be in 2050, 20, in 2060. But there's a lot of development that has to be done until, 20, until reaching the general AI. Uh, let's think about ChatGPT started three years ago-ish. Yeah. Uh, and the progress that we made with AI and with LLMs in, the, in just three years were huge. So imagine the amount of progress that is still pending to reach the general, the general AI. Um, and this book also talked about that prediction and how to predict uh, those movements, which is very interesting. But we are not even close, to be honest. So every time, there's another thing that I hear people, I hear sometimes we are saying, you know, 
hey, we are close to general AI. We are not even close to general AI. Um, yeah. So last, last minute. Um, it's about the jobs. We, we are all scared about the job, that the jobs will be eliminated, will be, let's think about it. Um, how many of you know about COBOL? Or how many of you developed COBOL? Did you develop COBOL? No, no. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, that, that was something that all the developers, um, we are not developing that anymore, right? So we, are, we, are, we switch or we move to another kind of goal. So that's, that's very, I always made that, that question and I always have two or three people that was using, working with that. Um, but let's go back in 2010, in 2011. What we think today, I mean, and how we predict the future, of course, is with information that we have today. Right. In 2011, we will think that if we ask to 2011, and this is something really cool from Google, because you can ask for dates, you can do search for dates, and I did some search in the 2011, which was the most, uh, the 10 technologies that would change the world over the, over the next 10 years in 2011. And printers, 3D printers, sensors, uh, a lot of funny things, virtual humans. Um, by 2020, robots will be physically superior to humans. Um, it says a brand, I mean, I didn't want to blame that, that brand. I mean, it wasn't intentional. But Blue Brain, for instance, in 2025, the robot population will surpass the number of humans. Yeah, we are close. <laughs> or probably we don't know that they are here. <laughs> um, yes, and the another one is, is the same thing. Mind control video games. Oh, well, sure. Software by Intel that can scan the brain. I didn't know we have that technology. Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> and another thing is, now let's talk about the jobs, right? What will be the hardest job for the next 10 years in 2011? Uh, waste data managers, seed capitalists, augmented reality architects, that could be interesting. Um, there wasn't any of the roles that we are thinking today that are hard. Uh, I like the urban agriculture. Yeah, but they are not even close. And if we do it today, we we'll probably will be laughing of that in the next ten years, or even less. In three or four years, we can we can we can laugh about it. What will happen? Uh, and it's something that natural, right? So we'll be migrating to new jobs, new jobs, new roles, new technologies, new whatevers. Uh, we'll be always migrating to that. Um, so that's pretty obvious, but it's something that will happen, right? There is a paper that is very interesting that talks about the exposure, and this talks about AI, right? They make a matrix between how your work, how your job will be more related to be replaced or to be complemented by AI. For instance, there is a high exposure and high complementary. For instance, judges or lawyers, they, they can take benefit of AI because instead of reading thousands of books, thousands of, I don't know how to say that, but it's a book uh, when you have all the laws, right? Um, they don't have to, they, they, they probably don't have to read everything. They just talk to a, an LLM and they can, can give you that answer. Uh, low exposure and low complementary dancers, these workers. I don't, I, I don't want to see an LLM model dancing. So it's something that we'll be keeping, and same for art, we'll be keeping on, on the same thing. But that's a really cool because the paper talks about all the, most of the jobs that are similar and how they are affected by, by that. But it's, amazing, it's basically in two, in, two, in two main goals, how exposed they are and how complementary they are. To be used by AI, and they and they give an an, uh, an index, AI or we. I don't know what it is by the way, but it should be AI complementary exposure or something like that. Okay, so conclusions. Um, we have just 
just to wrap up, the conclusion is, of course, simpler is better when we talk about the first one. Why do we need to use, when we are developing something, why we need to use LLMs or something really advanced when we have simpler solutions that can work better? Um, jobs will be mi migrating. Uh, open source is the key, uh, as usual. Uh, is we know the progress that we made as a community in the last 10 years or 15 years using open source. So open source is the key. And the last one be updated. So that's more like a, an advice and something that we try to do. Even if with AI, it's crazy to be updated. It's almost impossible to be updated because you have every day something new. Um, but let's try, let's try to do it. There are some QR codes here, if you'd like to see, to see it. Uh, there is um, AI everywhere, which is all the things that Intel is doing with AI. Our website, which is open at Intel. We have content, we have blogs, we talked a lot about open source and we love open source. And we have some coding sessions also. And if you'd like to hear our, our podcast, there's the QR code for our podcast when we used to interview. And same for the coding sessions. We try to talk to people from the community so they can come and talk about their experience or they can talk about open source. And that's it. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs>